Good day. I'm John Lunsman. For 30 years, I was the Director of Planning and Development for Chautauqua County. And during that 30 years, I fell in love with various parts of Chautauqua County. One of them is Chautauqua Lake. And I'd like to share with you over a series of presentations, Chautauqua Lake in the past, Chautauqua Lake presently, and what we might anticipate for Chautauqua Lake in the future. Uh, in order to do that, we have to understand what we're talking about when we talk about Chautauqua Lake. We're not just talking about some 13,000 acres of surface water. We're talking about 180 and a half square miles of watershed. For Chautauqua Lake is what its watershed dictates it will be. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the past history of the lake. I'm going to attempt to have you come back with me a million years. I realize that's hard for any of us to uh, cope with. And we're also going to talk about a trillion pounds of water. So there are some things that we're going to have a difficult time grasping. I have that problem. But I think I understand the disciplines of these particular things. One of the challenges of Chautauqua Lake, and I'm going to start this one off with a rip snorter, is that uh, based on the way map makers have created the boundaries of the towns of Chautauqua Lake, a portion of Chautauqua Lake is in the town of Ellery, a portion is in North Harmony, a portion is in the town of Busti and Ellicott, as far as the lake itself is concerned, and it's bounded by the village of Celeron, Lakewood, Bemis Point, and Mayville. And the village of Mayville has a corporate area which extends out into the lake. On top of that, we have to deal with the town of Harmony, a portion of the town of uh, Sherman, a portion of the town of Portland, and a portion of the town of Stockton. So that when you begin to look at the lake, and then you understand overlaying that is the fact that the state of New York owns the bottom of the lake and has a series of rules and regulations dealing with our natural resources. Uh, so it becomes a very complex issue. But I wish to propose a question. If we look at the history of Chautauqua County, we find that Chautauqua County was incorporated the total area of the county except for the Indian reservations was the town of Chautauqua in the county of Genesee uh, back before the turn of the century. In 1804, the town of Chautauqua was created covering what is now the boundaries of the county. In 1808, the county was split in half into the town of Pomfret and the town of Chautauqua. And the boundary of the town of Chautauqua and Pomfret cut the lake in this manner. This was Pomfret and all of the rest of this was in the town of Chautauqua. As we go through history, uh, we had the town of Ellery taken off, we had the town of Harmony taken off, which in 1917 and 18 became North Harmony and Harmony, and the town of Busti. And I have been researching the records, and at this point, I'm under the impression that when the town of Ellery was created, and the town of Busti was created, and the town of Harmony was created, that the legal description of those towns went to the shore of the lake. Not to the center of the lake, but to the shore of the lake. So I have the question that uh, our supervisor, uh, Jim Weidman, might be interested in cogitating, and that is, is all, most all of Chautauqua Lake still part of the town of Chautauqua? That's a conundrum that can float around for a while. We're going to look at nine different areas of discussion on the lake. We're going to start with the geology. There are three geology texts that are available, and you need to read them in an almost integrated manner. One, they were written in the early 1960s, a Muller, a Tesmer, and a Crane all either associated with the New York State Museum or with the U.S. Geological Survey were the authors of these documents. Muller and Tesmer deal with the history of the lake. Crane's work basically is a study of the groundwater resources of 
uh, the Jamestown area, which because of the location of the lake, he included all of the, the, uh, the lake in that study. The uh, work is uh, interesting. It has some wonderful illustrations in it. We're going to look at, if I could take you back, let's say a million years, and we stood on the top of the schoolhouse hill in Mayville. What we may have seen a million years ago was a river running through a deeper valley than we know now and exiting to the north, or possibly it exited in this manner. But when we look at the geology, and if any of you want to take a walk, walk along Lakeview Drive, walk up Evans Street, uh, and look at what is in the ditch, and you'll find that in the ditch along here and up these two hills, we're looking at shale. So that when the glaciers did pass over, they passed over this hill and moved on. We'll look at the glacier movement, possibly three glacier movements that covered Chautauqua County. Uh, we'll look at the retreat of the glacier and what it left us. If you read Obed Edson, or again the, the geologist that I mentioned to you, uh, we get references to a Chautauqua Lake that may have been 50 feet deeper, it may have been 30 feet deeper, it may have been 20 feet deeper than we know it today, depending upon what was happening some 10,000 to 16,000 years ago in the area. We'll take a look at North American occupation. We have information that suggests to us that people may have been in Chautauqua County as much as 10,000 years ago. Uh, this is evidenced by several Clovis points, which the archaeologists have uh, been given in many instances. We'll look at how people occupied the lake and the lake shore before a European man came to the area. Uh, interestingly enough, that now becomes a very important factor in almost all decision making that we make in Chautauqua County when we are dealing with state or federal funds because we must draft an environmental impact statement and we must look at prehistorical activities and whether or not we are going to impact them. Uh, we'll look at the fact that if you are familiar with Dutch Hollow Creek and Sheldon Hall down in this area, that based on the early notes of a person that recorded things in the early 1800s by the name of Heath, uh, it could very well be that Dutch Hollow Creek exited at Point Stockholm instead of its present position. Looking at another document written by Heb Helen Ebersall dealing with the hotels around the lake, uh, we'll look at the fact that Mr. Sheldon brought 90,000 wagon loads of gravel into this area to make the property work the way the family wanted it to work about the turn of the century. We will also look at the outlet of the lake because you can't talk about the lake without knowing what is, where the waters are growing, uh, the geology of that, the fact that the deepest point of the lake is here at about 75 to 77 feet, the fact of the size of this lake, the, there's almost equally divided, 56% of the surface area of the lake is here and the remainder is down in the lower lake. Uh, but 72% of the water of the lake uh, resides in the upper lake. In a given year, under normal hydrological conditions, the water in the upper lake stays there 526 days. It stays in the lower lake 105 days. However, we have intruded on into that historic record. We will take a look at what Celeron's expedition in July of 1749 says about they're coming to the lake. Uh, they're staying here on the 24th, 23rd through the 26th of July. They try to make a trip down through the lake. And their problems of navigating part of the lake, what they see in the way of, of uh, native occupancy, uh, actually they only saw some of the natives. They didn't make any real contact with them. Uh, the other problem is that Deceleron's notes were interpreted in 1878. And that person made some assumptions about what Celeron saw when he uh, came through the area. May I suggest to you 
that before European man uh, visited Chautauqua Lake, basically the landscape was one of mature forest. It had in it giant American chestnuts. It had pine and hemlock. Uh, it had oak. It had maple. All of those trees that you see today. We don't, of course, have the, the American chestnut anymore except as a brush plant. Uh, we also have an intruder into the area, which is the uh, black uh, locust, which came up off the lake plain as a uh, post tree. We will also look at the period of time when the Indians gave up their rights to Chautauqua Lake. I refer to it as the big drunk of Big Tree. And I don't know that that's respectful, uh, but the Indians were uh, given a rather interesting shuffle at that time. And following that and the clearing of the title and the transfer of the title to the Holland Land Company, by, 18, or by 1798, we began to see a fellow by the name of Ellicott and his crew um, surveying for the Holland Land Company. And they come into the area and they do voluminous notes. And unless you go read those notes, you can't appreciate what's in them. One of the things that intrigues me immensely is they describe a game fence in the Cass Run Valley uh, off the Conowango uh, by Ivory, New York, where their interpretation was that this game fence was built up and down the valley sides and the Indians drove the game uh, to the game fence and as they came through the openings in it, uh, they were able to harvest the game. Uh, there's a whole set of history that somebody ought to read and write about. I have to look at my outline. I have broken it up into the following areas. Geology, before local written history, which would go from 14 to 12,000 years before present to 1749, which is Celeron's uh, tour. It doesn't mean that there weren't Europeans here before. There were because in, in one of the references of Celeron, they talk about the fact that a Frenchman guided them around the rapids. And realize that uh, Jamestown's first name was the Rapids. Then we look from 1749 to 1860. And somebody might ask, why, John, would you use that as, as a reference break? Well, for two reasons. Uh, this is when European man begins to intrude into the watershed. And it takes us up to the time that the steam locomotive finally reaches the shores, or the railroads, reaches the shore communities of Chautauqua County. And of course, it's the beginning of the American uh, Civil War. And so that becomes a nice break point. Things dynamically change uh, after that. However, I would suggest to you that in that period of time, the Board of Supervisors of Chautauqua County uh, voted a resolution concerning the fact that there should be no netting in the waters of Chautauqua County. I believe that was about 1842. And in the 1850s, they passed a resolution that no one shall take fish through the ice from a certain date in February until ice out. And that anybody that would bring charges against somebody would get half of the fines that that person would be levied against them. And they would also, uh, the other half of the fine would go to the town for bridge work. However, it was a very interesting little sub note here. If the person was found innocent, the person that made the accusation uh, would have to pay all the court costs. Uh, that's something that we ought to think about may possibly in modern times. Then we will stop the historical presentation for a while, and we'll look at Chautauqua Lake as a hydrological system. And we'll look at what we've looked, thought about, about the problem of flooding around the lake and how we are now handling uh, that situation. Realize that we're talking about a lake which back when Native Americans used it, I believe that the lake had an elevation of 1302 to 1304, which is four to six feet shallower than we see it today. Then we have a gentleman by the name of James Prendergast who comes along in 1811 and builds a dam. And it washes out the following winter. He ends up in court and pays a number of fines. 
And then in just in the blending of the end of World War I, we have a new dam built with three tainter gates. And those, that dam and those gates are replaced in the 1980s uh, to the present gate and dam system. And I would suggest to anybody that when you're in the city of Jamestown, go down to Friendly's Restaurant. This isn't a commercial for Friendly's, by the way. But go down to Friendly's and look upstream, and you're looking at Warner Dam. And you can go down and you can walk both sides of the dam. Uh, realize that there were three dams, major dams on the lake uh, in that early period of time. The dam that Prendergast created was an over-the-top log stop dam with a series of channels running off of it uh, to various factories. We will look at Warren's history of Chautauqua County, which is nothing but a little book with a series of sketches in it. And he talks about the fact that uh, in 1823, they had to do some dredging in the upper lake because there was no water flowing down. And you begin to also understand as you read Hazeltine's history of the town of Ellicott and several of the others that people have totally misunderstood the hydraulics of not only Chautauqua Lake but the uh, Casadega and the Conowango. And in misunderstanding these, they, they went into tremendous efforts to do certain things that didn't prove out very well. We'll look at the land use of Chautauqua Lake over time rather quickly in tiny, tiny vignettes. Uh, the best records we have are from 1938 to present where we have aerial photography um, and we can really do a detailed study if we wanted to. But if you can imagine driving in the watershed of Chautauqua Lake today, when you look at a field in the watershed of the lake, realize that that field was not cleared with a bulldozer and a power saw or some other kind of mechanical device. It was cleared with brawn and handsaw and ox and horse. And think about the amount of energy that went into giving us the fields that we have today. And the fields that we have today are shrinking dynamically, particularly in the Chautauqua Lake watershed, as compared to what they were at the turn of the century. We look at the interplay of that and the hydrology of the lake, uh, we have 42 inches of rain generally falling in the lake on average. What does that mean? That means over a trillion pounds of water. John, why do you bring up a trillion pounds of water? Because it's energy, and that energy does things to the lake, and it does things in the watershed, and it gives us different types of manifestations, and we'll look at that. We'll also look at the 1942 and the 1950 Corps of Engineers report, which gave us a wonderful scheme to prevent any more flooding on the lake. Uh, we'll also look at what we are now doing to minimize the flooding uh, because we did not implement the recommendations of the Corps of Engineers. The first recommendation by the Corps of Engineers was don't build in the normal floodplain of the lake. That's the least expensive thing that we could do. Well, we, we didn't stop people from building into the floodplain of the lake. Then we'll take the next section. We will look at Chautauqua Lake is a biological system. Uh, somebody's going to say, uh, come on, Mr. Lundsman, how can you be an authority on these things? I was responsible during the Joseph Gerasi administration and the John Glenzer administration um, as county executives of overseeing and seeing to it that proper work was done related to Chautauqua Lake. 1971 to 1978, we spent over a million and a quarter of dollars of county taxpayers' money, which attracted state and federal funds to do studies about the Chautauqua Lake as a biological system. It was called the Benchmark Series. Uh, we were deeply involved with the environmental impact statement of the bridge, which doesn't show on this map because of its date. Uh, we were deeply involved in the oil and gas industry and the drilling that was going on in the county. And we'll relate some of the things that are found there back to the original uh, geological information. We are also involved in, deeply involved in the creation of sewer systems that serve from this area to here and from Midway Point all the way down to here and from approximately the South Boses all the way into Jamestown. And there's detailed uh, material available that tells us something about the lake that allows us to jump into the geological history and confirm it or 
illustrate some of the things that we've got to understand about the lake. When we get through with the biological study, which by the way, the biological section will be based basically on a series of reports that were published by the county planning department and went through and became part of the state of New York aquatic vegetative management plan, uh, where we do a, have done a detailed investigation of the lake, its ethnic organs and what is happening and how we should handle the, the vegetation that is in the water that frustrates a lot of people. Other people will vigorously defend it. Uh, we came up with a plan that became part of a, a state document along with its environmental impact statement. Uh, when John Glenzer gave me that assignment, I said, John, don't you realize that you have given me an absolute no, no, no win? Because no one is going to be happy with what the steering committees and the technical committee and uh, Mark Refrigette and Kelly Refrigette and I are going to come up with because it doesn't follow local feelings. The document is now in place. It's an important document. More people ought to know about it. We will then move back and I'll flip us back into history and we'll go into the, a very, very exciting time. From 1860 to World War I and some of the best information on that period of time is to be found in a couple of references and I'd like to show them to you. Uh, we have three publications done by the uh, Fenton Historical Society. I don't care in which manner that you read them, but they are absolutely intriguing. We have Chautauqua and Chautauqua Lake trolleys, Chautauqua Lake steamboats, and Chautauqua Lake hotels. These are tremendous Christmas gifts for people that would be interested in, in, and are intrigued by the history of the county. I recommend them to you highly. There are also several other books that are available, um, including our own uh, history of uh, Mayville by Devin Taylor. I recommend it highly to you. The problem is integrating all of the information that uh, is available in these documents. The, uh, if you can imagine 18 steamboats running up and down the lake, hundreds and hundreds of rooms in hotels with no sewer systems. When you have 132 people in a hotel at the foot of Erie Street in Mayville in 1800s, what did they do with the waste? We'll talk about that for a moment. Um, we'll also talk about the coming up to World War I and the uh, change of the dam structure. We'll look at World War I to World War II where all of a sudden the typical person of, of, of our society has more and more uh, time to, uh, for leisure activities and we'll compare a 1904 map of the shores of Chautauqua Lake with this 1954 map and then possibly I will bring in some aerial photographs that were taken uh, this May so that you can see how things have changed even more. World War I to World War II is an intriguing time. And then we come to peace in our country, 1945 to present. And we'll look at the things that we have done in the politics of the lake. Again, there are a series of, of references and sometime through the process, uh, I would hope that we'll be able to hold this up and you can see the two sides of what I feel are not all of the reference material related to Chautauqua County, but the references that I basically will use uh, in this series of presentations. Then we're going to do the, the thing that I was paid to do. I was the director of planning and development for Chautauqua County. And if I had had a CB handle, I would have called myself the paid dreamer because it was my responsibility with the county planning board to encourage the county legislature to do certain things that relate to the future. And I'm going to contemplate and suggest to you what the future of Chautauqua Lake looks like and some of the disciplines that we're going to have to deal with if we want Chautauqua Lake uh, to be the, the most pleasant thing that it is. Realize that I refer to Chautauqua Lake as my lake. 
I would hope everybody that is in the watershed of Chautauqua Lake and has property on Chautauqua Lake would refer to Chautauqua Lake as their lake. It's my lake, it's our lake, we are responsible for Chautauqua Lake and what it's going to look like. We've done some interesting things. If you can imagine, we had in Mayville a, a wonderful milk plant that processed millions of gallons of milk over the years. But in 1976, it was estimated that the little inlet that served the milk plant and the highway department was producing 28% of the phosphorus loading that was going into the lake. 1976, for all practical purposes, the plant closed down, although it was opened a little bit later for a couple of years. But it closed down. And the next year, there was a dynamic change in the weed community in parts of Chautauqua Lake. And I documented those and sent them to the professors at the State University College at Fredonia as part of our benchmark series. Uh, we have a very important responsibility. Uh, Doug Conroe, past president of the Chautauqua Lake Association, a person that I have tremendous respect for, uh, was one of the counterparts that we were involved in when we did the aquatic vegetative management study. And he took a set of information that is available in the history and said, look, the lower lake is going to disappear in 792 years. Now, what relevance is that to us? It's very important. We ought to look at what Doug Conroe was emphasizing at that time. Because if the rate of siltation that he was using as his projection is the general rate of siltation, uh, is it something that we can do anything about? We'll look at the watershed effort that was launched in the early 1960s and see what the agricultural people say about Chautauqua Lake and whether or not we can create any type of a cost-benefit analysis in a watershed plan to stop the siltation into the lake and to stop uh, the nutrient loading in the lake. We'll even take a peek at the 1985 Agricultural Act, a federal act which you wouldn't think had any role to play in what is happening on Chautauqua Lake. But if you go out through the watershed, which I did two years ago with the final study that I participated in as a volunteer, you'll find that the number of fields and cows in Chautauqua Lake's watershed have changed dynamically. And when the nutrient budget study comes out, uh, I guess within the next year, uh, we may have some interesting additional information so that we can look at at the future of Chautauqua Lake. Realize that there are a number of people that are interested in Chautauqua Lake. The Chautauqua Lake Association, these are the guys and the gals that have maintained the lake at least since the mid-1930s. And then we also have uh, the Chautauqua Lake Conservancy with uh, a group of people that are interested in the future of the lake, and we'll, we'll talk about them also. So I look forward to sharing with you uh, some knowledge that I have, and I hope that we can make it of enough interest to you that it'll excite you to become involved with Chautauqua Lake, our lake, my lake.